What's up, folks? Welcome to Mr. Chitwood's World History Class, and today we're going to be talking about the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution is going to be somewhat of a different revolution than the things that we've been talking about in the previous uh, couple of lectures in terms of the Scientific Revolution, or the Enlightenment, or the American and French, or the Glorious Revolutions. But it's all going to revolve around the same idea of change and this idea that society is progressing from its more of a basic form, a foundation of what we have known it to be and to where we know um, our society is in today's society. So the Industrial Revolution is going to bring about a whole bunch of change in terms of uh, how the world is operating and how people are interacting with each other and is our focus throughout this unit to focus on um, what exactly those changes were and how and why they took place. guys have a new essential question for this specific unit and lecture series, we will be discussing and inquiring as to what impact the Industrial Revolution had on Western economics, politics, and society. So you want to jot down that essential question before we move forward. What impact did the Industrial Revolution have on Western economics, politics, and society? Now, before we go any further, we spent some time talking about the American and French revolutions and, and what that meant to the people of those societies. What I want to pause for a second for us to kind of reflect and think about is what exactly is a revolution? What do we know it to be at this current time period um, where we're at in the curriculum for this class? So I want you guys to take a second to think about what a revolution is and, and how we've defined it before. Maybe jot down some notes in, in, in terms of some bullet, quick bullet points on your note sheet in front of you. But identify maybe three to five things that make up a revolution. So going into using your ideas and your understandings of what is a revolution, I'm guessing many of you guys identified either growth, growth or change or progress as some things that would define what a revolution is. Naturally, when we're talking about the American and French Revolution, there was a uh, fighting that occurred, there was disagreement of opinions, but ultimately a revolution is meant to bring about change and it's meant to bring about uh, growth and progress. What I want you guys to do is to take the next three to four minutes Jot down about four to five sentences on your note sheet as to what you think, whether or not you think growth and progress is a good thing or a bad thing. So go ahead and pause this video right now um, and resume it when you are ready to begin after you conduct that quick write. All right, so now that we have this understanding of growth and progress as either being a good or bad thing, I'm going to argue through one of my favorite uh, Disney films that growth and progress could be a good thing. But what we might see in this film clip, that it could also be a pretty, pretty bad thing. So let's take a second and, and interpret how growth and progress, maybe in the Industrial Revolution, could potentially lead to something, some sort of bad idea. Thank you. 
All right. So in terms of us trying to understand what we can learn from Wally in this one minute and 18 second film clip is we're kind of confronted with this idea that Wally, this machine that is tasked with kind of fixing and repairing and, and collecting all this trash and compiling it into a smaller form on Earth now that it's become inhabitable is tasked with an insurmountable job in, in which he's trying to, by himself, clean up the Earth so that it can be inhabited a, again. Um, and how this relates to Industrial Revolution is that what we're going to see throughout this unit is that the ability to make things quicker, more efficient, and in more abundance or quantity is going to be something that is really characterized in terms of the Industrial Revolution in the sense that the ability during this time period, people's ability to make things and make more of them very, very quickly is something that comes about and potentially could lead to ultimate problems down the road. And we'll come back and visit Wally at the end um, of the next lecture. But uh, I want us to keep in mind this idea that maybe perhaps there's good things about growth and progress and there can also be some bad things as well. So let's begin with talking about the timeline. Where are we? What are we talking about in this? Uh, in this series of lectures. So what we're going to be talking about is right, roughly between 1700 to 1900. Um, we're not, we're kind of moving past the Enlightenment period in the American Revolution, but we're still not quite yet to almost modern day world history where we're talking about like the 1900s or the 21st century. So we're still kind of in that si same time period, but um, we should know that this stuff is kind of all happening at the same time as one another. So what was the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial Revolution was, uh, it can be defined primarily by the increased use of machines to replace manual labor. Basically, the development of machines to kind of make people's lives easier, to basically be able to make things more efficiently and make um, more of things um, much more quickly. So the Industrial Revolution is the increased use of machines to replace manual labor. And the Industrial Revolution, as you guys might have known from your textbook reading already, is that it's beginning in England primarily, but for specific reasons. So the Industrial Revolution begins in England around the mid 1700s. And this is where we see a mass production of machine made goods and it replaces what is called the old cottage industries meaning it's moving away from this idea that in england you primarily had a lot of people and elsewhere around the world as well had a lot of people making things on their own family farms or at their own uh, houses to basically subsist their lives they weren't really dependent on too many other people or or um, other companies, I guess you could say, to make sure that they got the stuff they needed. It was all done on their cottage or in their farms or within their families. But what we're going to see is throughout the Industrial Revolution, people start to move away from the farms and into um, more urban areas. So why England specifically? It was the right place, right time, right conditions. Uh, there was uh, more labor because with the developments and farming that we will talk about. Uh, there's less people needed to farm, so there's a surplus of labor. Um, there's also large amounts of resources within reach like coal and water for power and transportation of goods and stuff. Um, economic climate in this area was pretty strong. They had a lar large amount of government support with good markets, economic markets um, at home and in other countries. So basically, Europe was uh, still kind of either recovering from the French Revolution or other revolutions that have been occurring in England had uh, was as well, but they had kind of bounced back um, a little quicker than others. So we started to see that Europe's eco England's economy was a little bit better than many of the other places throughout Europe, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but there's also this thing called factors of production, things you need to be able to industrialize either a city or a country. Um, in general, you need land, labor, and capital. You need land, which is like natural resources available for production. You need labor, which is the human input into that production process. Capital, which is the goods used in the supply of those other products like technology or like a factory or a warehouse. 
And you also need an enterprise, which is like entrepreneurs, people to organize factors of production and to take these risks to make these this more money. So what we see in England is all of these things coming together to help this country industrialize quicker than others. They also had great transportation systems. Most of them uh, were, uh, most importantly, they had railroad lines extensively throughout the entire region and country of England. So that also helped and waterways made things a little bit more easily and, and transported throughout the country. But we should know that to sell an item, it has to go to the market and the faster, cheaper, the better. That's why people like Amazon Prime in our today's society, because we can order something and have it in our doorstep the next day and sometimes even the same day. So uh, being able to order something quickly and get it in your hands is what people like. So with industrialization, the quicker you could get something to market and the faster and the cheaper, the better. Uh, so you start to see that people move factories to the resource location. If they needed water, they would move it to a wa the factories to a water um, air, uh, area, like with a stream or a river or a lake. If they needed coal, they would move uh, their factory and their production to the coal mines, um, all with the ability to give people more access to products, saying, hey, wow, I want that, and being able to supply that good to them. And also with the new increased production in railroads and also factories, you also it also means that there's new jobs for people as well. So the natural resources that England had specifically was coal that was burned for fuel, iron ore, which was um, a natural resource to build machines, and also rivers for water power and transportation. So coal is obviously going to be something significantly used within uh, the railroad system in terms of trying to actually power the trains, the steam powered trains. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. You have this kind of water wheel um, where you're taking the energy from the motion of the water in a, in a stream or a lake and creating some sort of um, electricity and power uh, that would be in this generator um, building behind it. So let's talk about the process of industrialization. There's three processes specifically that is more food, new machines, the birth of factories, and urbanization. So um, let's take a minute to watch this quick video that is gonna recap the causes of the industrial revolution. until the beginning of the First World War in 1914, a period of great social, political and economic upheaval unfolded across the globe. Every aspect of daily life was transformed in some way. The Industrial Revolution began in Britain during the early part of the 18th century. Prior to this, life in Britain had remained largely unchanged for generations. People lived in agrarian societies. Farming was ruled by the seasons and the harvest was at the mercy of the sun rain and wind. There are many contributing factors that made the Industrial Revolution possible. Too many to cover here. In this program, we will focus on the Agricultural Revolution, the rise of the factory, new technology, and the role of Britain's empire. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be happy with a nickname Turnip. Well, believe it or not, one Englishman, Lord Charles Townsend, was given the nickname Turnip Townsend, and we're about to find out why. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most people in Britain lived in open field villages. They relied on subsistence farming, which produced enough food for the peasants or tenants of the landowner, but little, if any, extra. Farmers used a system of rotating crops over three fields to grow food. Each year, two of the fields were used to grow crops, barley and wheat for example, while the third field would lie fallow, left unplanted, to allow the soil to replenish lost nutrients. Livestock would graze in the fallow field, helping to fertilize the soil. In the following year, the crops would be rotated through the fields, one fallow, two productive. Peasant and village households were given a number of strips in the fields to plant their crops. 
From the 16th century onwards, landowners started turning open fields into enclosed paddocks that were assigned to a single farm. They wanted to bring their land under tighter control and make it more productive. This also meant the peasants were no longer able to strip farm and sometimes could not access water. Now unemployed, most of the peasants had two options. Work as a hired labourer on a farm or seek employment in town. Some of the larger landowners subdivided the land and then leased it back to the peasants. The way in which crops were sown was improved when, in 1700, Jethro Tull invented a horse-drawn seed drill that could plant three rows of seed at a time. It was able to drill a hole, drop the seeds in, and cover them over with soil in one action. Prior to this, seeds would be thrown by hand into the ploughed furrows. Some seed would be eaten by birds, and some blew away with the wind. Jethro Tull's seed drill dramatically improved production by increasing crop yields five-fold. In 1730, the Rotherham Triangular Plough, patented by Joseph Foliambi, had an iron blade rather than wood, and its design made it lighter and easier to use than earlier ploughs. It required only two horses rather than four, and one ploughman. The Rotherham plough had the dual benefit of cutting labour costs and saving time. And now we come to Turnip Townsend. During the 1730s, Lord Turnip Townsend introduced the Dutch four-crop rotation system to Britain. The four-crop rotation system rotated wheat, turnips, barley and cloves, for example, through four fields. The turnips and cloves helped nourish the soil with nutrients which, in turn, would produce a better wheat and barley crop the following year. In winter months, turnips were fed to livestock. This meant that it was no longer necessary for farmers to slaughter their beasts before winter. Improvements in farming had a dramatic social and economic impact in Britain. It now took fewer people to produce more food. By the end of the 18th century, farming had been transformed from primarily satisfying basic food and clothing needs of the village community into a commercial opportunity to sell the increasing food surplus to emerging local and foreign markets. So, having this understanding that there's um, more food being able to create this new um, industrial economy is going to be important when we move forward in our understanding of steps two and steps three that is talking about new machines and the birth of factories. So people started making small machines to make life simpler and more productive. And then they thought, well, larger machines, the larger the machine that we create, the, the more that that larger machine can do for us. So they start to, started to think out of the box in terms of not just thinking like Jethro Toll was in terms of trying to make this new seed drill, but looking in terms of like, how can we make multiple people's lives better rather than just one at a time? So we start to see people like John Kay create this thing called the flying shuttle, um, the Eli Whitney creating the cotton gin, James Watt creating the steam engine, Robert Fulton creating the steamboat, and even George Stevenson creating what is a very, very basic sense of the rocket, just something that is moving very, very quickly. And each one of these started to feed uh, the other in turn. Basically, one once one invention was made, the need for um, it helped another, and then so on and so forth, creating the cycle of invention and progress and growth. So you see uh, one image right here being a oil or a water pump, a very large pump, but still being able to do a lot more than maybe just like a hand pump. You have the steam engine in terms of being able to power steam boats. And then also you can see by the label here on this image, this is a depiction of a old school rocket. So the importance of steam cannot be understated in terms of new machines and the industrial revolution as steam power creates a cheap power source and it replaces human labor. Thus, it's powering the machines and producing more with fewer people being needed to produce that stuff. So more produce goods, more buying, more buying means new markets, and the more resources needed to produce, 
more so people can buy more and it creates this cycle which we will see um next unit when we get to imperialism that there's this constant need for more stuff to create more stuff therefore the development is creating growth and progress but it's also going to cause a pretty bad thing as we start our investigation in terms of how the industrialization affects other places around the world and lastly we're going to be talking about step three that is the birth of factories and this idea that there's this move away from the domestic system where work was done at home uh, making basically subsistence farming at home keeping the family unit together and producing everything you need in one place whereas the factory system you start to see that they locate them near rivers or water power to keep the, the actual production going machines start to become too big for the home so you have to have these big factories and warehouses um, you also see this division of labor where you have many workers working to complete one thing very quickly rather than just one person trying to accomplish the task and in some places we only see building only part of the final product where uh, in one place where somebody else is building something that goes along with what you're producing so they all get brought in together at, at one another place to create the final product and basically through this process of the factory system things are being made cheaper quicker and more efficient but at the same time as we'll see in our investigation that it also comes this growth comes with some bad uh, economic and social consequences as well so with that, we're going to wrap up and conclude this video. Um, next time, we're going to be talking about the uh, effects of the industrialization era. So stay tuned for that. And having said that, go ahead and switch on over to that crash course film to complete your notes. And we will pick this up next time.